privilege to be invited to speak at uh, the symposium. And I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Al Zero and the staff of the International Hospital of Bahrain for making this such a remarkable occasion. Uh, thank you very much to Peter, who of course has been my mentor and colleague and friend for getting on for 30 years. I did do my first job with him in the good old days when we used to do um, war grounds uh, to see our patients, sadly a thing of the past with day surgery. And uh, here is Mr. Hamilton and me leading him to do my, my war ground. And this is his heavy workload. He always used to carry two briefcases, I'm not quite sure why. Uh, lasers, as we know, have universal applications, uh, not only in medicine, but now in many aspects of society. The first use of concentrated light uh, to treat retinal conditions was uh, uh, introduced by my sugar in, in Germany. And uh, he developed the xenon arc photocoagulator, which has been seen as a rather different beast from the instruments we're using now, but it proved very effective in proving the principle that light can treat retinal conditions. Uh, the ruby, then the argon laser quickly supplanted the uh, xenon laser, uh, being in use from the 1960s onwards. And our interest, I collaborated with Peter on this early work in diode lasers began in the mid 1980s. And of course, since then, we've had a plethora of different wavelengths and different kinds of lasers for all varieties of retinal conditions from the front to the back of the eye. The diode laser at the time was a remarkable innovation, unlike the uh, gas or air-cooled or water-cooled systems prior to it. The diode laser was high for cooling, it was high for compact, and could be fitted into a portable system. This was the first prototype we developed with John Marshall and others back in the 1980s, a direct top down scope version. I don't suppose you see raincoats in Bahrain, but this is what we need in London weather. And this was the, uh, the uh, night of the first time we used the diode laser clinically. As you can see, Peter Hamilton hasn't changed one jot. I've changed rather more. Uh, that's John Marshall, Tim Fitch, and Richard Keeler who sponsored the research. The slightly depressing thing is that all the figures here pictured with me are younger than I am now. Uh, with regards to lasers in the eye, of course, it's important that the laser energy can be absorbed uh, within the target tissue. And different wavelengths are absorbed to different degrees by different pigments. Uh, the diode laser, originally 8 and nanometers, near infrared, has effective absorption with the melanin, the retinal pigment epithelium, low absorption in hemoglobin and negative absorption in xanthophone. And these aspects I'll touch on. Another aspect of the diode laser, uh, unique to it compared to the visible wavelengths, is it has high spheral transmission properties, allowing transspheral treatment. The, the lasers we've been using, which are getting near infrared, have a number of delivery systems which take advantage of its wavelength characteristics, uh, slit that mounted, laser indirect, endo probes, and of course strength transferable probes for both Dorcaine work and retinal work. And these are examples of some of the instruments I use in King's College Hospital. The initial histological work was to prove the principle that this novel wavelength for ocular needs could produce retinal burns. And there's no question that it was very effective at producing a burn as with other wavelengths, very similar to argon. Unlike argon, however, uh, there's really no absorption in the blood. So unlike argon, which produced damage to the retinal vessel in passing into a blood-filled structure, diode, infrared, krypton red had high transmission through blood, which made it very effective in diabetic conditions where you might have a thin film of free retinal blood for a fine vitreous image. As I said, there is 
little absorption in the yellow pigments from the macula, which makes it very safe for macular treatment. And when we did the initial clinical trials, we really found that uh, the diode laser produced effective burns and was effective at inducing regression of neovascularization in proliferative diabetic retinopathy, making the vessels go away. So as Peter Hamilton often says, the laser is a laser. And similarly for focal exudative maculopathy, once again, despite our initial concerns that its low absorption within hemoglobin might make it less effective in treating maculopathy, you can see the fresh burns, but equally the patent microaneurysms. Nonetheless, some months later, the exudate would resolve and the microaneurysms resolve. And of course, there are a number of other applications of the diode laser, rectal brakes, endo laser probes available, and I'll touch on transpiral treatment. Visible wavelengths really are stopped dead if you try to apply them across the spiral, as opposed to diode infrared. And neodymium yak, also infrared, uh, it passes through the spiral very effectively and is only stopped by the first, first pigmented structure it encounters, which is the uh, melanin in the pigment epithelium of the retina or in the ciliary epithelium of the ciliary body. Uh, the diapexy probe is uh, engineered to be excellent for getting to the back of the eye. It's allowed like transferal treatment uh, in the post and pre epitorial region. And one uses an indirect ophthalmoscope to perform this treatment as one would use a cryopexy probe. And here's an example of a patient who had a central retinal vein occlusion, very hemorrhagic, very difficult to do standard transpapillary treatment, but with a transpiral probe, a very effective pattern of burns was achieved as you bypass the media opacities. And in my VR work, I, I exclusively use the uh, diode laser endoprobe. And uh, the nice thing about the diode laser is there's no colored filter, so your view is not obscured, and uh, there are no bright flashes of light because the human eye finds it very difficult to uh, pick up uh, infrared uh, exposures. Uh, in recent years, we've been going on to uh, concept of microplast treatment, uh, initially for the treatment of diabetic macular edema. As you know, uh, laser treatment has a number of potential side effects, including hemorrhage and devastatingly uh, inadvertent foveal damage causing reduction in vision. And in the old days when we didn't really know what we were doing, suddenly you would often see this rather depressing picture of the macula being obliterated, not only by inadvertent placement of the burn over the phobia, but the tendency for visible burn scars to spread and enlarge to eventually uh, cover the phobia. And a conventional laser burn produces a rather large fibroblast scar, which can be counterproductive. This is a pigment field preparation we expose to an argon laser scar, causing a very deep crater. The concept of micropulsing uh, envisages chopping up the standard conventional laser pulse into a train of much smaller pulses, each of low energy. And so within an envelope of, say, 200 milliseconds, you might have 100 little uh, micropulses. But depending on the uh, length of the on time as opposed to the off time, this is accomplished through software modifications from laser, you can increase or decrease the amount of energy within each micropulse. The concept being that when each micropulse arrives at the retina, there is a very focal, limited to a few cells of pigment epithelium, increase in temperature. But by the time the next pulse arrives, the tissue has cooled sufficiently to prevent thermal spread to surrounding structures. Micropulse exposure, on the other hand, uh, produce much smaller uh, burns, much less plume, and uh, altogether, in terms of the burn energy, much safer for the back of the eye.
And once again, you know, high power scanning electron micrograph of uh, RPE cells and micropulse exposure, as opposed to the crater produced by the argon, just takes out a handful of pigmentophilian cells. On the one hand, that's quite good. On the other hand, we're used to seeing visible burns, and could this be effective? We've been looking at the treatment of micropulsing for diabetic macrodema, drusen, and more recently, diabetic endovascularization. Uh, the treatment parameters are uh, unimportant uh, for the purpose of the talk, but one can select quite precisely the amount of energy we're going to apply to the eye through micropulsing. But the aim is to produce an invisible burn rather than a visible exposure. And one can, with one's laser, uh, set the various parameters on time of a tenth of a millisecond, off time of 1.9 milliseconds, uh, or, or increase by double the uh, on time to double the energy, depending on uh, the threshold power at which you produce a uh, visible burn and you reduce it, the power to produce a sub-threshold. And this is a different iteration of the same diode laser. We did three of the follow-up of our uh, work with um, micropulsing for diabetic macroedema, uh, myself and my colleague Schober, and we found in essence that uh, there was a good result. No laser-related side effects. The majority of patients had reduction in clinically significant macroedema, and vision was stabilized. My colleague, Richard <coughs> Chong, did a randomized study, compared to the frequency of the eye with micropulsing, and once again found no difference between the two, except you couldn't see the burns with micropulsing. Here's an example of a phobial threatening exudate. Six months after micropulsing, no exudates and also no scars. And Victor Chong met with this slide showing similarly effective results, but once again, no scars. So the concept of minimal treatment does seem to be effective in this case. How might it work? Probably mediated by some biochemical mechanism related to suppression of VEGF and possibly increased oxygenation of a previously ischemic retina. And work by John Marshall on uh, Krypton red exposures uh, shows the concept of the indirect mechanism of action having a beneficial effect on uh, peripheral retina uh, quite nicely over 20 years ago. And some basic sciences work we did, I won't go into the detail, showed in essence that uh, micropost exposure caused a reduction in TGF beta levels in uh, prepared uh, melanin RPE cells, very equivalent to uh, a standard wave uh, treatment, with post treatment a reduction in levels of TGF beta, showing that the effect of laser is based upon a subtle biochemical mechanism of action rather than a blunderbuss therapy of heavy burns. So, in essence, the benefits of micropulsing are they minimize the functional side effects like blindness, color vision, field constriction. It's pain-free because the energy is so low, but it does seem to work. And my treatment protocol currently is for mild to moderate edema during micropulse with alone, and moderate to severe and micropulse plus avastin. And this is just one example of an Indian businessman who travels a lot, doesn't turn up very much, arrived with quite marked bilateral CSMO, more on the left, I did bilateral micropulse therapy, but gave him an intravitreal injection of Bastin for his left eye as a more, as a more severely affected. And uh, he did very well. He didn't uh, have this high powered uh, treatment, but compared with uh, a conventional therapy, and had no visible burns, but the uh, redeemer resolved. So, in conclusion, with diode lasers, you have the ergonomic advantage of solid-state technology, but the biophysical advantages of near-infrared with effective treatment on the retina, with the ability to transpiral treatment, high transmission across the uh, uh, 
blood and low absorption in, in xanthophyll. With the right range of applications that I've touched on. Thank you very much.